it's my pleasure and honor to present five uh, outstanding young scholars who are going to present papers uh, before us. I, um, I'm honored and pleased to do so. I'm also, ironically, going to do, serve the same function this afternoon when the AALS presents uh, honors to two outstanding papers that were part of a AALS process for young scholars. So I'm especially pleased with what I'm having to do today. A little bit about procedure. Uh, our commenter, of course, is Professor Richard Epstein, an American institution in terms of the law, the legal academy. I mean, what can one say about Richard? Other than that, we're very, very honored to have him here and look forward to his comments. Uh, we're going to proceed as follows. There are three public law papers among uh, our professors and two private law. What Richard requested, and I think it makes sense because we're dealing in widely divergent areas, is that we present the three public law papers first, each getting 12 minutes, precisely, exactly, and then Richard will comment, Professor Epstein will comment on those papers, and then we will do the two final private law papers. And in fact, we have them organized that way at the table here. First, we're going to have Professor Kaiser, then Professor Schwartz, then Professor Stansel, and then we're going to have a break for uh, Richard to uh, comment, and then we're going to do follow the same procedure with the final two papers. So we begin with Professor Kaiser from the university, or excuse me, from Brooklyn Law School. Professor Kaiser. Thanks so much for the invitation to participate. Uh, my paper deals with temporary legislation, and recently scholars have advocated for the increased use of temporary legislation, and indeed we now see hundreds of tax provisions expiring year after year. They keep getting renewed again and again, and also we've seen them being used on a very grand scale, applying to massive tax cuts. And why is this the case? Why do we see this increasing use? Why was the estate tax repeal sunsetted, for instance? Uh, well, here's the story. In the 1970s, Congress enacted, uh, uh, revised its budgetary rules. So they enacted a fast-track reconciliation process as part of budget reform efforts to reconcile its budget with the deficit reduction goals it set forth in the beginning of the year. And because fast-track reconciliation meant that the Senate tradition of unlimited debate did not apply, there were incentives in a closely divided Senate to use it expansively. There's no filibuster for this type of legislation. So people began attaching deficit increasing riders to reconciliation, and the literal language of reconciliation did not prevent this. Uh, some senators thought this was an abuse of the process, and so therefore began to curtail the uh, abuse of that process. And so they had, uh, uh, they forbade non-germane amendments, including for purposes here that is relevant, one that prohibited reconciliation legislation that produced cost outside of the revenue window period. And uh, in the early 2000s, uh, Bush wanted to enact tax cuts, some of the largest in history, but Congress was evenly divided at the time. We had a uh, uh, evenly divided Senate with uh, the VP as a tiebreaker, so there was no way they could overcome the filibuster and pass these tax cuts. What did they do? Well, they, they pushed them through reconciliation, and this was the first time that we saw tax cuts that were deficit increasing uh, as a whole, as the legislative package as a whole, uh, being pushed through the reconciliation process. How did they get around these rules that pro prohibited costs outside the revenue window period? Well, they sunsetted them uh, so that the budget window period, uh, um, there was no cost outside of that budget window period uh, that was at the time 10 years. So that's why we saw the sunsets this year. So the Senate passes the tax cuts. Uh, they're signed into law. 
although they sunset 10 years later, Congress picks up on the fact that sunsets actually reduce the revenue cost of legislation. So they continue to employ them again and again when deficit hawks uh, are uh, uh, hemming and hawing about the cost of tax cuts, and it also makes paying for them easier under revenue offset rules. Now, critics said that this use of sunsets was gimmickry, that no one expected the sunsets uh, to uh, um, uh, uh, have legal consequences, and therefore the costs were massively deflated. They did, however, have legal consequences, as we became acutely aware of last year, and so they're different from other pure budgetary gimmicks that are employed by Congress, I would argue. More recently, however, it's been argued that temporary legislation actually produces more reliable budgetary cost estimates for Congress than permanent, or what I call lasting legislation. I call it lasting legislation to highlight the fact that uh, it isn't permanent. It can be repealed or amended. And this is because legislation is scored only up through the budget window period. Again, this is usually a 10-year period, although it can be adjusted by Congress. Because extension of temporary legislation requires congressional action at such point, Congress will take into account that full cost of the temporary program, and it will do so upon each of the reenactment dates. In contrast, when they enact lasting or permanent legislation, they are faced with only the official cost estimate up through the budget window period upon the single enactment date, or so the argument goes. Now, I contest this view because it suffers upon a reliance on the baseline estimate. And this ties into the official cost of the legislation. The official cost is simply the difference between the amount of govern government revenues that occur with the legislation and the amount of government revenues that occur without the legislation or the baseline. And so for the thesis to be true, the baseline must assume that the temporary cuts are going to expire as scheduled, and that the permanent laws will continue. And this seems like a reasonable assumption, but there's nothing to tie Congress's hands to this treatment. And indeed, Congress uh, has deviated from this treatment uh, for most of the expiring tax cuts within its baseline calculation for purposes of important rules like PAYGO, we don't have to pay for them. Uh, and also, both the Bush and Obama presidential budgets manipulate the baseline such that the cost of extending the temporary legislation is zero. And I would argue that in these cases, temporary legislation does not have the advantage that's been pointed out by scholars uh, over lasting legislation. The baseline is simply shifted so that these are unaccounted for cost when reenacting the sunsets. And this is because the baseline is employing an accounting fiction, really. It's saying that uh, temporary legislation is assumed to have already been continued, or already been renewed, even at the time the legislation is up for renewal. Now, second, the article posits that temporary legislation will often have economic effects beyond the budget window period. And in these cases, temporary legislation will also face the same critique as lasting legislation that produces costs outside the revenue period. How these costs compare, of course, will depend upon uh, the specific provisions at issue. But this phenomenon will always lessen the ability of the budget process to fully account for temporary legislation. And from my research, it looks like a lot of temporary tax cuts indeed produce these costs outside the budget window period. 30 to 40 percent, perhaps, uh, often produce significant cost outside the budget window period. Third, I argue that Congress takes into account official cost estimates, uh, but in addition, good government reform groups uh, and constituents highlight to Congress the unofficial full cost of lasting legislation, the costs that occur outside of the budget window period. And so I provide several examples of this in the paper, and this further closes the gap between the cost uh, treatment, the cost estimates of temporary and lasting legislation. Well, now you get to the point where, okay, there, there may be similar uh, accounting problems with both lasting and temporary legislation, but temporary legislation perhaps has a review function. Uh, it forces Congress to review the legislation at the time of the sunset. And I think that this is a difficult task, however, made more difficult when interest groups come on the scene because sunsets mandate repeated encounters between legislators and interest groups at each sunset date, uh, a, a dynamic that 
is exacerbated by lobbyists who may not be uh, aligned, or their interests may not be aligned with the interest groups, uh, legislators may become captured at the sunset date. And indeed, this is what we saw at the state level during the massive sunset uh, reform efforts that we saw in the 1970s. Uh, many, many, many states tried this, and nearly all of them abandoned these efforts because the review function simply did not work. Uh, I also question whether sunset provisions uh, we can target the right legislation ex ante. I think that this is uh, difficult to do. Also, it's true that uh, these aforementioned critiques can be lodged against uh, lasting legislation, but temporary legislation also has significant disadvantages, uh, the first of which I mentioned is that political economy concerns through repeated threats of extraction, temporary legislation may also lead to more um, um, or threats of expiration. We may see more uh, uh, rent extraction. This may be uh, the case because even though an interest group may be uh, willing to pay less because it's a temporary provision, campaign finance uh, laws create the need for a smoothing effect, which temporary laws provide. Also, people care much more deeply about short-term benefits versus long-term benefits, which are equivalent on a net present value basis. Second, temporary legislation may produce entrenchment concerns. They force the law to change even when the majority of Congress wants it to continue. And in this manner, a current majority prevents a future majority from uh, having control of, over the legislative agenda. And it may create, crowd out the legislative agenda by uh, forcing the future Congress to consider these sunsets uh, at the sunset date. The counter argument, of course, is that lasting legislation also entrenches. And Congress has to get in gear to repeal an undesirable law, which is very difficult. Uh, so are we stuck with entrenchment? I'm not convinced that these two types of entrenchment are identical. It's plausible that a future majority, Generation Z, for instance, would prefer the policies of Generation Y over those of Generation X. And uh, in this case, if Congress does prefer the immediately expiring law over the archaic law, then sunset provisions are going to uh, uh, entrench Congress by forcing it to consider uh, legislation that's being flooded with sunset dates that uh, require actions that it must take in order to uh, avoid these undesirable results. Also, the timing may be problematic, as we saw. This sunset date may occur when uh, the country is facing a crisis. It may occur when they're facing an election. It may occur during a lame duck Congress. And so this is going to exacerbate these problems. Uh, I also argue that temporary legislation produces planning concerns. This falls on both the public and private side. Uh, per Fairly straightforward argument, so I won't get into it here. Uh, so my recommendation really is a rebuttable policy presumption for lasting legislation and against temporary legislation. I distinguish, however, between sunsetted legislation that is enacted at the outset for uh, experimental or emergency legislation, that is legislation that is enacted at the outset to be truly temporary versus legislation that is enacted at the outset to be permanent but is temporary only because of revenue or budgetary concerns. The latter doesn't have a natural end date, which causes planning difficulties, and the continued reenactment, I think, will easily be pursued and exploited by lobbyists and lawmakers as a result of the disconnect between the sunset date and factors external to the budget process. This would otherwise limit the renewal length. Uh, in contrast, this dynamic is less likely to occur with legislation truly intended to be temporary. It's also, I think, easier for the legislature to get the breadth and the length of the sunset right uh, when it is uh, keying it off of an emergency or an experimental period. Political economy concerns may be eased. Interest groups will also have a harder time, I think, continuing to lobby once the emergency is gone. I talked also about how lasting and temporary legislation both raise entrenchment concerns. To evaluate them on this front, we could look at the benefits of entrenchment that each has to offer. I think here is where non-emergency uh, uh, temporary legislation may be worse from an entrenchment perspective. Lasting legislation there, the entrenchment aspect of it may allow the government to make credible commitments. It may make government itself more uh, stable, and this is something that Madison recognized, uh, that Madison warned of violence 
violent struggles that would occur, uh, uh, sunset dates, which Jefferson had advocated for. Temporary legislation, I think, is more tricky due to the differences in the categories that I've outlined. On the one hand, we have Congress uh, enacting a provision that itself wants to be truly temporary. Uh, and here, entrenchment does provide a relatively certain point, time in which the law is going to change. This eases transition costs, which are a concern that many scholars have identified uh, with changing law. And on the other hand, we have temporary legislation that Congress does not intend to be temporary. And there, I don't see uh, a benefit that entrenchment has to offer. So in the end, I conclude that legislation intended by Congress to be temporary, as in the case of emergency or experimental legislation, may be appropriate. That being said, even though a sunset is adopted uh, with good intentions, it may be co-opted by uh, 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 strong interest groups or uh, uh, parties seeking low budget estimates. Thank you, Professor Kaiser. Uh, now we're going to hear from Professor Andrew Schwartz from the University of Colorado. Thank you very much. I'm certainly delighted to be here. My article is called Consumer Contract Exchanges and the Problem of Adhesion. It's forthcoming this summer in the Yale Journal on Regulation. So this is an article about contract exchanges. What's a contract exchange? Well, I define a contract exchange as an organized market where contracts are created and traded among strangers. Famous example, the most famous example, is the Chicago Board of Trade, uh, where for the last 150, 160 years, you can go and you can't buy any wheat or butter, no commodities are for sale, uh, but you can buy or sell contracts for the future delivery of those commodities. Um, contract exchanges are good. Uh, they're good for participants. They create a liquid market which facilitates trading among anonymous strangers, allows parties to hedge risk or speculate. They're also in the broader public interest. Uh, they reduce scarcity and glut. Uh, they offer price discovery, uh, can help us avoid famine, uh, for example. And they're generally key to economic growth. I claim that there are two institutional attributes that are necessary to a functioning contract exchange. First, you must have non-negotiable standard form contracts. Second, those contracts must be reliably enforceable at law. Let me go through each one. First, why must non-negotiable standard form contracts be used? Well, for a liquid market to exist, all the contracts must be fungible. The co so the contract can be compared solely on price. So the terms all have to be identical, as well as the underlying subject matter. Grade A butter is grade A butter. If each contract were unique, it's hard to know which is the better deal immediately. So this liquidity that created by the use of standard form contracts is valuable, and it allows for offsetting or reversing trades. Uh, second, these contracts must be reliably enforceable at law. Well, the, why is that? The purpose of the contract exchange is to facilitate trading among anonymous strangers. That increases liquidity. Uh, and anonymous strangers can't engage in informal relational contracting. That only works when parties uh, interact repeatedly over time and know each other. This does not mean that Chicago Board of Trade contracts are routinely sued upon in court. It just is enough that the shadow of the law, that everyone knows that ultimately it is an enforceable contract, that's enough. Okay. There are other common and useful uh, attributes of contract exchanges, such as the use of a clearinghouse, margin, membership rules. Uh, those are optional, uh, and so I'm not really going to go into those uh, right now. Um, so in short, uh, contract exchanges are good. Uh, and, but for a long time now, uh, they've been the exclusive domain of the wealthy and powerful. This is just a function of the physical space constraints of exchange halls. Uh, even a very large hall can only hold a certain number of people. Um, so the seats on these exchanges became very valuable. And today, uh, a seat on the Chicago Board of Trade costs about two, three, four million dollars. This, meant, this means that ordinary consumers can't directly participate. But this has all changed in the last 10, 15 years thanks to uh, the internet, advances in telecommunications. We're no longer limited to physical trading halls. Um, and so this has allowed the advent of a new type of contract exchange, one that doesn't have seats, uh, 
uh, one that invites ordinary consumers to participate. I call this a consumer contract exchange. I think this is an exciting development. It brings the liquidity uh, benefits and other benefits that I've discussed of contract exchanges directly to consumers. And we've seen uh, in the last, as I said, 10, 15 years, a couple of examples, and really nascent, uh, primitive examples, but starting to arise. Uh, one you might be familiar with is Hotwire, or Priceline.com, uh, where there's a marketplace for fungible travel services. If you want a compact car at the Denver airport for two days, you can receive anonymous offers from companies and uh, just compare them on the basis of price. Uh, Priceline and Hotwire display these two attributes. The contracts are all identical. Whether you end up with Thrifty or Avis, it's a perfectly standardized form contract. Uh, and it's reliably enforceable, these contracts. The consumer is forced to pay up front with a credit card, no problem. And the companies are, you know, uh, as reliable as Thrifty or Avis ever is. Um, in theory, the liquidity benefits of this contract exchange should mean that consumers get better prices on Priceline and Hotwire than, say, Expedia or Orbitz, uh, and Consumer Reports reports that they do. Uh, Consumer Reports has found that consistently those two sites get the best prices. Uh, another uh, consumer contract exchange that you might be less familiar with is called Prosper.com. This is a so-called peer-to-peer lending website where consumers pool their money to make small unsecured loans to one another. Uh, again, the two necessary attributes are there. Standard form contracts, yes. Every single loan made is perfectly identical. Uh, and are they reliably enforceable? Well, more on that later. Um, uh, and uh, Prosper, unlike Hotwire and Priceline, has advanced the ball to a secondary market. These loans, once they're made, can also be traded among participants on that site. Once again, theory suggests that we should see better rates, uh, uh, better interest rates available there than otherwise. I don't know of an empirical study showing it, but uh, anecdotally, there are many people on this site seeking to refinance their credit card, other loans, and seem to be happy uh, with the rates they're getting. Great, wonderful. So what's the problem? Well, the problem is the legal doctrine surrounding so-called contracts of adhesion. In contract law, a contract of adhesion is a take-it-or-leave-it standard form agreement. A common example is the Google Terms of Service. If you want to do a Google search, you must agree to the Google Terms of Service. By the way, pressing search uh, is your assent. Uh, and uh, so uh, a contract of adhesion under contract law is really the combination of two elements, the use of a standard form and non-negotiability. The law, contract law, disfavors contracts of adhesion because a key normative underpinning of contract law is that contracts are entered into voluntarily and knowingly. But the process of adhesion contracting, to quote Professor Leff, is not one of haggle or cooperative process, but rather of a fly and fly paper. So some scholars, perhaps many, have suggested that courts should generally refuse to enforce contracts of adhesion and just use the default rules of contract law. But because contracts of adhesion are so widespread and useful in lowering transaction costs, as we all know, the law has not gone that far. Rather, the modern uh, contract law holds that contracts of adhesion are to be substantively reviewed by the court for fairness and only enforced if fair. This is a consequence of the so-called unconscionability doctrine, which requires a party to show both procedural and substantive unconscionability to be relieved of his contract. Contracts of adhesion are, by definition, universally viewed as procedurally unconscionable. Thus, all contracts of adhesion are open to the substantive unconscionability, the substantive judicial review of their terms. This is, I don't need to remind you, in marked contrast to the way that contract law treats ordinary negotiated contracts, which a court will simply enforce as written. Uh, without inquiring as to whether it's fair in some sense. Um, the result is that contracts of adhesion subject to this fairness review are less reliably enforceable than ordinary contracts. Uh, a recent empirical study found that courts uh, refuse to enforce contracts of adhesion, at least in part, an impressive 43% of the time. So we've come to a paradox. In order to function, a contract exchange requires a legal system that reliably enforces non-negotiable standard form contracts, 
But the doctrine of adhesion contracts means that non-negotiable standard form contracts are not reliably enforceable. In the context of traditional contract exchanges like the Chicago Board of Trade, uh, the courts have recognized this problem and have dealt with it. Um, they have held, many courts have held, that although exchange-traded contracts, uh, like on the CBOT, clearly meet the definition of a contract of adhesion, they should not be treated as, the, as such. Rather, they should be strictly enforced as if they were ordinary negotiated agreements. And the courts expressly say this is because this is required for the exchange to function. If we held otherwise, uh, the exchange could not work, exchanges are good, so we're going to change the rule. There is no case law, in part because the development is so new, there's no case law that I know of addressing this issue in the context of consumer contract exchanges. And consumer contracts are where the law is really most concerned about adhesion. The Chicago Board of Trade uh, traders are wealthy, sophisticated professionals. Maybe it's a little easy for the court to say they don't need the protection of the doctrine of adhesion. But traders or uh, participants in Prosper.com or Priceline are ordinary consumers, and courts might well hold that those exchange contracts are contracts of adhesion. This uncertainty, I submit, has stunted the growth and development of consumer contract exchanges to the detriment of consumers. Prosper is a tiny marginal player in these consumer loans. Hotwire and Priceline contracts are for very small amounts. There's no secondary market allowed. Why not have a secondary market, at least for hotel rooms, say? Uh, why not have $10,000 luxury vacations on Priceline? Why not have a million dollar angel investing uh, fund on Prosper? Well, there's a couple of reasons. Some of them include uh, regulatory problems. The Transportation Security Administration doesn't allow people to trade their airline tickets. But even if all those problems were solved, we still would be left with this problem of adhesion that makes these contracts not sufficiently reliably enforceable uh, for, the, for the exchange to really uh, fully work. Um, I therefore argue, and this is my conclusion, that when an appropriate case arises, the court should make crystal clear that exchange-traded consumer contracts will not be treated as adhesive but will rather be strictly enforced as written. For this is necessary for these consumer contract exchanges to function and benefit all of us. Thank you. I'm reminded in class, um, very, very commonly, a student will raise his hand and say, but Professor Nelson, that's a contract of adhesion. And my response in the standard setting is that life is a contract of adhesion. And uh, it, 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 gen it engenders uh, some humor, but there's also a little bit of truth to it. Uh, in the mortgage context, and I teach mortgage law, we have standard forms, and we've had them ever since the 1970s. They're called Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac standard forms, and they've survived the contract of adhesion argument because when they were drafted, they were drafted by a group of maybe a dozen interest groups on all sides of the political spectrum and the economic spectrum. Now, our next uh, speaker is Professor Paul Stansel from the University of Illinois, and his new paper is called Standard Making. Uh, thank you, and uh, I should note at the outset that this has not yet been submitted for publication, uh, but my grandmother has the bad taste to turn 100 tomorrow in North Carolina, so I am leaving. Uh, almost immediately uh, after this to catch uh, the plane for her birthday party. Uh, so I would love to hear from you by email uh, if you have uh, questions and comments that we otherwise might have taken up at lunch or, or later. Uh, this piece uh, can be summed up in uh, really one word, or one, two words, character matters. Uh, the piece is an exploration of the influence that the ideal character of regulation may have upon the distance between a policymaker's ideal point, what they want to happen, and the policy that we actually get in the real world. Uh, to situate the piece, it's a public choice, sort of public, uh, positive political theory piece that is consumed, uh, concerned primarily with transaction costs and agency costs. Uh, and in particular, I'm concerned with the typical regulatory context in which we have uh, a regulatory principal uh, who is delegating enforcement authority to a regulatory agent that might have different ideas about what they want. 
Um, and the piece focuses on the transaction costs associated with restraining agent infidelity uh, and, the, and the upper bound that those costs impose upon agents who are interested uh, in attempting to privilege their own preferences over their regulatory principles. Uh, my key conclusions are, are pretty simple. One, the ideal character of regulation matters. Uh, there is a potentially different transaction cost arbitrage story if the best objective response to a regulatory problem uh, is more rule-like as opposed to more standard-like. Uh, and when I talk about character, I'm talking about, about more rules uh, versus standards. Uh, second, institutional context matters. Uh, that is, the institutional context in which these relationships take place affect the transaction costs that are associated with reining in an unfaithful agent. Uh, and finally, uh, the, the piece itself finishes uh, with a uh, uh, sort of a, a plausible real-world explanation, I think, of the Twombly and Iqbal debate uh, where we see uh, the difficulty uh, that Congress uh, at least may have been having trying to essentially articulate a standard uh, and query whether the Supreme Court has been able to privilege its own preferences uh, as an interpretive agent um, and uh, by, uh, essentially by arbitraging the transaction costs associated with a congressional fix. Uh, so. The, uh, the problem is one of rules versus standards, so, so let me define them briefly. Uh, I'm using sort of standard, uh, yeah, the standard uh, definitions from the literature. Uh, rules are given their content ex ante, their substantive content, standards ex post. Another way of looking at it is that rules are deterministic uh, and uh, as opposed to discretionary. And I use a, a, a definition of rule that avoids uh, some interpretive problems because I'm talking about rules uh, as I'm defining them as, uh, as, as, uh, as law that is effective in confining an agent's discretion. And the key point here is that even if we bracket the agency cost problem completely and agency uh, issues completely, there exists for a given regulatory problem, or for many given regulatory problems anyway, some ideal type or character of regulation. Um, and here I'm focusing, for the most part, on the extremes. Uh, my hypotheticals will talk about more or less pure type rule or pure type standard preferred problems. Uh, but the important move is that a regulatory problem has some ideal response in terms of character. Uh, this is not wholly independent, though, of the, uh, of the locus of the principal's preferences. And what I mean by that is the more extreme a principal's preferences are, um, uh, the more attractive a rule may become. Um, but for the great middle, it's often a more complicated story. Uh, here is where I would, if I was uh, technologically sophisticated, introduce a, uh, uh, a preference map. Uh, but instead, I want us to all engage in a, an exercise of visualization um, where we have a spectrum coming from left to right. Yeah. Um, and uh, imagine that you have a regulatory principle that has a preference right here um, and an agent that is tasked with uh, interpreting that, uh, that preference, uh, whose preference lies some distance away, say, to the right. Um, the question of whether uh, the agent is actually going to get what it wants out of this is a question of transaction costs and indifference points. Uh, in other words, um, whether the agent is able to privilege its preferences over its principles uh, depends upon uh, how much it will cost the principal to get back at the agent, to, uh, to, to discipline the agent in some way. Um, and, and so what I'm mostly concerned with is sort of transaction cost uh, related indifference points. Uh, and in particular, there really are two different kinds of transaction costs I'm, con I'm concerned with. One of them are sort of standard baseline costs. And these are institutionally contingent in the sense that uh, a, a, the federal government, the United States federal government, is going to have higher costs than, the, uh, than, than a dictatorship uh, in terms of uh, promulgating its regulations. Um, but they are going to still be, there's going to be some amount of effort it takes for anyone to regulate anything. And if I'm an agent tasked with uh, interpreting, um, I've got a little bit of wiggle room there, right? Because, well, Congress is going to have to get off its rear end and fix this, and that takes effort. Uh, and so they may, not, they may not do very much. And those are going to be standard costs that are, that are institutionally dependent. 
In addition, though, there are going to be other costs, agency-related costs, um, and, and I break them into three real categories. The first uh, relates to this question of ideal character. Uh, that is, um, and I'm happy to take up a circularity problem that I think some of you may identify uh, at some point, um, but I think that there's an ideal character for regulation that exists in sort of a Rawlsian sense, um, regardless of what the uh, expected uh, agent-principal relationship is or what the, uh, the specific preferences are of the agent um, that is tasked with enforcing. Uh, and this is... Um, then the second category, agent discipline, uh, the idea that there are costs associated with uh, disciplining agents, and these are different depending on context. And then the final, and what I would describe as my most tentative uh, set of costs at this point, are costs associated with range shifting. And I'll explain what I mean by that in a second, but I'm going to take each in turn. Uh, t talking first about uh, ideal character related costs. If the ideal character of a regulation is a rule, that is something that is uh, more on the deterministic side, um, they are still going, they're going to be costlier to promulgate in the sense, and when I talk about promulgate, I mean simply to, uh, to, to sit down and debate and deliberate and pass uh, than an equivalent standard because you've got to do the determining. That is, you have to go and sit down and say, okay, well, what exactly should this rule be? Um, imagine if there were no agency relationships, it would be still easier for us to agree among ourselves that the speed limit on, uh, on Geary Street outside of the hotel should be um, some, a speed reasonable to conditions as opposed to, for us to, come out, um, out, as opposed to coming up with some exact number. Um, if the ideal character of regulation is a standard, uh, then uh, those sorts of problems, uh, if, if you are forced to make them rules instead, they get really expensive, right? Imagine what it's like if you have something that really should be governed by a standard and realizing that because of agency concerns, you have to instead lay it all out. Um, this, the, these get very expensive. Um, the second set of costs with which I'm concerned are agent discipline costs. And these are, as I said, institutionally contingent. Uh, a high cost environment may be Congress and uh, the Supreme Court in the context of statutory interpretation. Uh, it's going to be very difficult for Congress to discipline uh, the Supreme Court uh, in, uh, if it's a, we're talking about statutory interpretation. Uh, contrast that to a chief of police who is not doing the will of a city council. Uh, Maybe considerably lower cost to just fire them uh, or to discipline them in some other uh, way that their contract allows. Um, Congress, of course, when it is the agent, when it is the principal and it is uh, having to discipline agents, whether we're talking about the courts or agencies, um, the, uh, they have a few ways they can handle this, right? Budgetary power, impeachment uh, in the case of Article III judges, for example, um, and there are several others. But again, it, it is institutionally contingent. Finally, you have uh, this idea of range shifting, and this is um, the idea that in some circumstances, the regulatory principle may be able to articulate a new standard that, while still subject to interpretive arbitrage, uh, moves the whole thing uh, over enough in the principle's preferred direction that the agent is effectively constrained to a point much closer to the principle's ideal point. Uh, and this interacts with agent discipline in the sense that articulating a shifted standard may lower the cost of disciplining the agent. Uh, if Congress were to pass a statute fixing civil pleading standards as uh, one House bill uh, would have um, from the last Congress, uh, codifying a relatively extreme version of Conley's no set of facts language, uh, while explicitly prohibiting any reference to plausibility, what we, uh, what we have in Twombly and Iqbal, uh, the resulting law would still be mostly standard. That is, that courts would still be tasked with case-by-case -case determination of, what, of whether a plaintiff has satisfied uh, the, the pleading requirements. Um, at the same time, uh, if the court were then to ignore this new standard um, in favor of extension of the Twombly and Iqbal principles, it would uh, cost proportionally less at this point for Congress to discipline the Supreme Court uh, than if the new statute had not been passed. Now, uh, importantly, when you're talking about range shifting, the resultant bill or, or regulation need not represent Congress's or the, uh, the principal's actual ideal point. Rather, it, is, um, it has the ability to act strategically uh, 
to get at final equilibrium more in keeping with its preferences. However, this creates its own set of problems because when you do that, you're running some risks uh, that a statute of that sort is going to be pretty salient, uh, regulation of that sort is going to be fairly salient, and it may be more difficult to pass uh, because folks are going to look at you and say, well, what, a, what exactly are you doing? So to finish up, uh, the piece um, is primarily concerned with finding the, the right indifference point. Uh, and I think at this point, my tentative view uh, is that for mo in, in, the, uh, in most cases, we're talking about a least common denominator approach, where you want to look at the principal's preference, um, the agent's preference, but then the distance that you can go is essentially, the, the sh uh, if you are the agent who wishes to arbitrage, is the shortest of the distances between sort of the, uh, the cost of fully rule regulating uh, the cost of disciplining the agent, sorry about this, um, right, right over your head there, and then also um, the cost of shifting the range. Uh, and that is uh, way too much to do in 12 minutes, uh, and I look forward to hearing from Professor Epstein and others. Thank you. Let me first at the beginning say uh, this is a sufficiently confused day that I think I'm guilty of a category error. Uh, that is, poor Andrew sitting in the middle of two public lawyers really should have had his name begin something after Stansel and before Yaki. Um, I'm going to try and cure that by talking in, in slightly different out of order. I'll talk about Rebecca and Paul first, then I'll turn to Andrew, uh, knowing that everything I say about him will apply, of course, to what Jason and Robert have to say. This is a very convenient way of doing business. Um, uh, there is a very important question that one has to face in dealing with large administrative law. And it's the question as to whether or not when you look at this subject you want to take it large bore or small bore. And, and what we do is we have here two small bore papers which essentially assume the legitimacy of the substantive law on the one hand and of the existence of the administrative state on the other hand. And they're trying to figure out how it is that you make peace with this system in an effort to try to improve the way in which it operates. In the one case, and these are very big problems that we're trying to deal with in this quote small ball universe, you're trying to figure out the optimal duration of legislation, which is the question that Rebecca is trying to talk about. And then when you're starting to talk about Paul, you're trying to figure out how it is that you switch between rules and standards in order to deal with the question of how it is that a principal, assuming we know what that principal is, could control an agent, assuming we know who or what that particular agent is. And my own view about the problem is that essentially neither of these solutions will work, not because they're wrong, but because what we've done in effect with respect to the administration state is we have so many degrees of freedom that are available with respect to what Congress can do as a substantive matter that it will become extremely difficult to use a series of second tier rules that are related to the organization of the administrative state which will be able to confine the discretion that is going to be given to either or to both levels. In other words, if you try to figure out how it was that the 1935 sort of Supreme Court synthesis took place, 19, or, you know, the New Deal synthesis in some sort, essentially it rejected all classical liberal principles that definite property rights and constrained situations and said in effect that what we can do is to create an open tapestry in which political participation through the administrative state will outperform a system of limited government with strong property rights and relatively small things. I think what we've seen here is that the efforts, and these are really ingenious and very learned efforts to try to control this, shows that you really cannot make this happen. Let me see if I could explain why. And this is not by way of criticism. This is by way of melancholy observation. Start with Rebecca's paper. Essentially, what she is trying to do is to figure out why it is that your presumptive, rebuttable presumption default rule ought to be in favor of permanent legislation as opposed to temporary legislation. And of course, there's a great deal to be said in favor of that particular provision as an abstract matter. One of the ways in which I would put more stress on in the paper than in my discussion than she did is to figure out how it is that the set of rules that are generated at the public level not only influence what's going on in Congress and the administrative agencies, but are trying to figure out for private people, figuring out what sort of investment strategies ought they to adopt in a universe 
universe in which you're never quite sure exactly um, how long the time horizon is going to be. So on the tax matters which she talks about most, and I, I think tax is rather somewhat distinctive, she's surely right when she says you never want to drive yourself to temporary regulations because you think that filibusters and other procedural devices make this a convenient stroke, and that she's also right, I think, when you say with temporary legislation you always have a crisis at the time of renewal, and I think if anybody looks at the sort of down-to-the-wire negotiations of the tax bill, you can see really just how far you come there, and you don't get it right anyhow. On the estate tax, you get 2009, which essentially escapes from the system because these bozos couldn't figure out how it was that they were going to put the whole thing together. But the difficulty is the same as you have in the law of contract. Default rules and rebuttable presumptions are not strong enough weapons to prevent the evil forces that are out there, and that means just about everybody, um, from trying to play the public choice game. So it may well be that what will happen is that the outcomes will surely differ. If it turns out that you've got temporary rules and a burden of proof now trying to make an extension, as opposed to having permanent rules where the efforts are now going to be to create some kind of a temporary exemption, uh, but you just never know which way this thing is going to play out because once you have the permanent rules, somebody will not try to repeal it. What they'll try to do is to introduce some kind of an exception to it, which will give them a favorable example and put more tax burdens upon everybody else. And, and I guess this, I, my own sense about this is if, in fact, these presumptions are only rebuttable and if, in fact, you're going to have political forces working in both directions at all times, the likelihood that you'll come up with a relatively stable system on under these circumstances is going to be highly unlikely. I, I just do not think that we are going to be able to stop and to control these kinds of problems by getting rid of the loopholes, which I think we ought to do. Um, what's my own view about this? I'm just going to talk first about tax for one minute and then about general regulation. On the tax front, I've generally taken the following kind of position, is that what you really want to do is to limit the degrees of freedom that Congress has by moving very sharply and decisively to a flat tax. I mean, this is one particular element on which there's an enormous amount of division and uncertainty. You want to get that out of play. And then what happens is the only thing that Congress is going to have is a choice of either raising or lowering rates, and I'm much more willing to give that on a temporary basis if, in fact, you've got a permanent structure which moves in the opposite direction. In other words, what you try to do is to get rid of one degree of freedom. They still have the problem of long-term investments, and I think under this thing, I, what I do is the, the tax code actually has some very intelligent provisions. So, for example, if you put some property into use on a certain day, uh, you get the depreciation schedules that are allowed for property that are done that way, even though you have to take the variations in income rates, right? And I think that's generally a good way in which to do things, because you don't want people making billion-dollar investments today and then be told that the depreciation schedules are going to change upon them tomorrow and so forth. So I think, in effect, it's possible to really work these kinds of variations out and, and to try to control the problem with a kind of a mixed strategy. Uh, the interesting question, which she doesn't consider, is what do you then start to do? Oh, that's them. I thought it was me. Uh, um, what do you start to do if you try to extend this scheme to other forms of regulation, uh, safety regulation, FDA regulation, and so forth? A and I think in general, under those circumstances, I agree with her. I think that the permanent framework is by and large going to be better than the short-term framework. Uh, there's a rule which says that an old tax is a good tax because it's a stable tax. And essentially, I think the same thing is true with respect to regulatory frameworks. Uh, given the constitutional degrees of freedom, however, the same caveats will, will apply, you're not for the most part going to be able to find ways in which you can create that degree of stability unless you have stronger protection of property rights and unless you go back to the original view of a smaller Congress, which means that there are fewer ways in which you could trade things back and forth across issues. So turning to Paul for a second, it's the same sort of problem when you start to deal with rules and standards and principles and agents and so forth. Uh, the first point to note is that he has a very simplified model, which has to be, one, instructive, and two, completely wrong. Um, uh, the point about it being an instructive is if you were to assume that you had a Congress which was absolutely coherent in what it believed and had a life which lived unto eternity and devoted it to an agent which was also a unicellular kind of operation, 
absolutely convinced in what its particular principles are, you give me the simplest assumptions and what you do is you result in shipwreck in terms of the way in which the interactions take place between these two parties because the agent will essentially start to migrate away from the principle and in fact, once it does that, the principle is going to find it very difficult to come back and hit the agent. So now let's just make the thing a little bit more complicated and see what happens when you start to do it, okay? Well, the first thing that you have to do is to recognize that this Congress is not a unitary entity. It's not a principle as somebody is in an ordinary kind of um, product market or, or you know, a company with coherence. Uh, it's a bitterly divided, thoroughly confused, completely addled-brained operation which has 535 prima donnas, each of whom insists that he or she is entitled to define what the law is. This does not operate as a unity. It operates for a short period of time. It tends to operate through committees that have inordinate you know, powers and in conclusions, and then what they do is they delegate it to a group of people who themselves, in fact, are very complex organizations. Try looking at the inside structure of the Federal Reserve Board, for example, which I've been doing some work with lately and so forth, and you realize that chaotic does not begin to capture uh, the description. Then, of course, you have the temporal element, which is the Congress that passes the legislation, is not the Congress which is, in effect, going to have to revisit the legislation when things go coming, and it is simply a matter of fantasy to assume that the Congress, which is now just convened, is going to have the same set of preferences on, say, Twombly and Iqbal uh, that the previous Congress had, and uh, you'll get bills introduced, but I guarantee you they don't have a prayer in hell of passing a Republican Congress under these circumstances, independent of their merits. So if you're now trying to figure out against this particular grid what it is that you're going to use to control these people, the relationship between rules and standards, it seems to me that the first set of considerations considerations dominate the second set of considerations. Um, the difficulties are going to be structural much more than they are going to be in sort of monitoring in, in this simple dichotomy. model. And the second point I wanted to make about this paper, which I think is every bit as important, is when you start looking at these speed you know, limit examples, do we standards, rules, and norms, it's not just that you have an agency problem there. It's that you have a genuine disagreement on substantive matters as what's the optimal strategy with respect to speed limits. And you know, the way in which you can do it is you can say drive as circumstances permit. You can have a speed limit. You can say you've got to go 75 miles an hour. Right? And then you have a minimum speed limit of 45 miles an hour. And then you can get a traffic jam. So all of a sudden everybody's backed up and they're all under duty to go 45 miles an hour and to crash into one another. We don't really believe that. So what happens is you have to have all sorts of sub rules that get developed within a speed limit to explain exactly what you're supposed to do when there's a somebody stopping in front of you when there's a flat tire, when weather conditions become inclement and so forth. And what we do is we adopt mixed strategies. And, and we are going to adopt those mixed strategies even if we have perfect agencies. So that you have to understand that a lot of the ambiguity that you get on the rules and standard debate is not just on the monitoring issue, it's on all these other issues as well. And, and the only thing that I can see that will make this work is to stow constrain the types of behaviors that you want to regulate in the first instance, uh, that it will allow you a fair shot of getting it right. And so just to go back to the twombly Iqbal situation, uh, the part of the bar which is most emphatically upset with this rule is essentially the employment discrimination part of the bar. I, I think that's clear, correct, isn't it, Paul? The antitrust guys don't like it, but here's the difference that you have with the antitrust people. In fact, most good plaintiff antitrust lawyers rely on public information and government investigations before they file their case. So the asymmetries which you overstate in the paper, I think, do not exist in that area. In the civil rights cases, it's much harder to do that. But the civil rights cases represent a terrible body of substantive rules because in the first instance, motive becomes essentially the dominant feature, and if not motive, it's going to be disparate impact. And these are just tremendously difficult inquiries to do, and you don't have any safe harbor or hard-edged rules that will protect you. And so the defendants say, you allow this stuff, it's terrible, and the plaintiff to say if you disallow it, it's terrible. You've got a substantive set of rules which optimal discovery rules will give you very high error cost on both sides. And essentially it's all inferior to the market, so you don't want any of this stuff anyhow. So a modest solution to this problem is to repeal Title VII in competitive industries, which I'm sure will get the universal approbation of everybody who's involved in this battle on the Hill. Now this then gets us to Andrew's paper, right, in a perfect segue. He's the market man. <laughs> 
He's my hero on this particular date, and this is why he's a hero. He's actually a timid hero. Uh, the correct point, I think, is to make is that all of the hullabaloo, starting with Fritz Kessler and before him Patterson on insurance contract, about what's wrong with standard form contract is essentially based on a colossal form of economic ignorance, which ought not to be allowed to be replicated anywhere in the civilized world. Uh, the serious benefit that is associated with respect to standard form contracts are these. Well, one is that they reduce transactions cost by essentially allowing you to whip out the same form to everybody and not have to go through negotiated arrangements. You never want to believe what John Dewey said when he said that the sign of a good bargain is people spend all their time haggling behind the French, you know, or behind the back, the fence at the back of the house in order to decide the price of a cow. I mean, if you try to run mass industries on high transactions, high transactions cost, low transaction volume, everybody turns out to be out of business, and the transaction forms essentially do it in the model in many cases that Grant Nelson put his forward on that. The second thing, of course, that we tend to forget is that standardization is not only a matter of an A and B situation, it's a matter of exchanges. And that means you get large numbers of people together, and if you're going to try to lump and retrade these things, either they're standard or it turns out that they're nothing at all. The Romans understood this when they had standardized forms with respect to guarantees. The financial markets understand this when voluntarily they impose standardization requirements with securitization. The same thing is true with respect to exchanges. The point even goes further than that. In the work that I've been doing recently, for example, on interchange and payment systems, there is no way you can reach a pure competitive equilibrium because these are all industries that have to work off of platforms and the only way in which it turns out that they're efficient is that the platform maker, say Visa or MasterCard, has to impose a price that it will pay with respect to the banks on the issuing side and on the other side with respect to the merchants and so forth. If you do not allow standardizations, these markets will completely disintegrate. And so the reason why his case is so strong is in fact that once you understand that the sort of simple competitive models, A, make standardization relevant, it becomes a fortiori in the many complicated network industries that develop today that standardization is going to be even more important because there the interdependence between the various players is taken as a given and unless you can amalgamate by way of standardization, you're back to the back fence and last I heard that was not a very good way in which to do business. So this is I think a classic illustration of why it is that the progressive critique of the sort of the early part of the 20th century has shown itself to be wrong and we just have to hope that he's right and that courts will go very strongly to a full enforceability model. Okay, I'll be down. Now we're going to hear from Professor Robert Wagner from Case Western Reserve. Thank you all for being here. I appreciate the opportunity to present my paper. Um, my paper is titled, Gordon Gecko to the Rescue, Insider Trading as a Tool to Combat Accounting Fraud. In this paper, I argue for the legalization of what I have termed fraud inhibiting insider trading. Now, fraud inhibiting insider trading is a subcategory of insider trading that's been specifically designed to help combat accounting fraud and some of the corporate collapses that we've seen over the last decade or so. In the paper, I give examples from recent cases in which insider trading could have been used to help avoid some significant harms. I present arguments that have been made against general or traditional insider trading. I focus on the two most prominent arguments against insider trading. One, that it erodes confidence in the marketplace. And two, that it is similar to other types of theft and should be prosecuted accordingly. I look at previously unexamined empirical evidence, and I argue that while the evidence is not conclusive, it does suggest that the confidence argument is incorrect and does not satisfy a reason to prohibit traditional insider trading and much less fraud inhibiting insider trading. I then look at the property theft analogy, and I argue that while it may be the strongest position regarding general insider trading, it's not as compelling as initially thought given recent empirical research and it also doesn't satisfy um, prohibiting fraud inhibiting insider trading. Now, the purpose of fraud inhibiting insider trading is to put in place a safety valve 
so that when managers realize that there is a problem with the valuations of their firms, they're not locked into bad choices, which consist of either doing nothing and being financially devastated, or committing insider trading and, if caught, still being financially devastated and potentially going to jail, or three, committing fraudulent accounting practices in the hopes that fortuitous circumstances will prevail and things will all work out. Now, in my model of fraud inhibiting insider trading, insider trading will be allowed when four elements are satisfied. The first is that trading be based on negative information that will undoubtedly lower the stock price when it's revealed, so-called price decreasing insider information. The second element is that the trading be done on behalf of an individual who will himself or his immediate family members be directly impacted by the reduction in the stock price. The third element is that the person have the ability to either prevent or alter the release of the information. And the fourth element is that the individual not have participated in any type of fraudulent activity prior to the insider trading. Now, in order to convince people to allow fraud inhibiting insider trading, it's helpful to first examine what have historically been the main arguments for outlawing insider trading generally. The first being that insider trading adversely affects confidence in the market, and the second being that insider trading is analogous to property theft. The first objection is based on the idea that regardless of whether insider trading is in fact harmful, people believe that it's harmful and therefore they will not trade if they think it's being allowed. In the most recent Supreme Court case, United States versus O'Hagan, there's actually no mention of individual harm in specific transactions. Rather, they focus on the harm and a decrease in public confidence in the market. Proponents of insider trading regulation have argued that banning insider trading by increasing the confidence of uninformed investors may lower the premium that they require in order to transact business and in turn lead to more stable and more liquid markets. However, this argument that insider trading will increase transaction costs is focusing on all types of insider trading. It's much less compelling when considering fraud inhibiting insider trading due to the possibility that the loss prevention component will actually work as a safety valve and release pressure and reduce the transaction costs due to the reduced risks. Furthermore, fraud inhibiting insider trading could actually increase confidence in other contexts as well. For example, several commentators suggested that market rumors and speculation and not risky strategies actually precipitated the loss of investor confidence that led to the fairly recent collapse of Bear Stearns and Company. Fraud inhibiting insider trading would have helped to limit this speculation. So the idea is that if investors can look to certain executives and know that if bad information is on its way, they would be able to sell their stock. They're not selling their stock. They will be less likely to engage in this type of speculation that ended up leading to the collapse. Now, not only is it possible that fraud inhibiting insider trading could increase confidence in the stock market, but the public has actually never shown any signs of losing confidence in the stock market because of the existence of insider trading. As part of my examination of the empirical data, I looked at a period of time when insider trading became widely known and discussed, namely the mid-1980s. In April of 1985, Business Week ran a headline saying, the epidemic of insider trading. The SEC is fighting a losing battle to halt stock market abuse. Now, one of the most publicized cases during this time was that of Ivan Bosky. If any of you have seen the original movie Wall Street by Oliver Stone, the character of Gordon Gekko is actually based on Ivan Bosky. Um, now, I use this incident as a general guide to determine how insider trading actually affects confidence, both of investors specifically and people generally speaking. Now, when the Ivan Bosky case was announced, the Dow, in just, Dow Jones Industrial Average was at 1,873. A week later, it was up to 1,893. A month later, it was at 1,922. And after six months, it had risen to 2,325. So this means after the release of the information of the most widely publicized and notorious account of insider trading in the history of the stock market, the Dow Jones Industrial Average actually increased by approximately 25 percent.
Now, it's possible that the value could go up while confidence was still shaken and perhaps less trades were occurring. In order to try and account for this, I looked at the volume of trades that occurred. And on the New York Stock Exchange, the year following the Ivan Bosky incident, the volume had actually increased by 34%. Now, both of these indications are indirect indicators of what actually happened with the confidence in the market. In order to attempt to get a more direct indication, I looked at the general social survey. Now, the General Social Survey is a survey that's done by the University of Chicago since 1972, every couple of years. Now, in the survey, there were two questions that I looked at. The first question was, I'm going to name some institutions in this country. As far as the people running these institutions are concerned, would you say that you have, one, a great deal of confidence, two, only some confidence, or three, hardly any confidence at all in them? And the two institutions that I looked at were major companies and banks and other financial institutions. Now, in relation to banks and other financial institutions, in the year following the release of information concerning the Bosky insider trading scandal, rather than a loss in confidence, as the theory would predict, there was actually a modest increase in confidence. However, as one might expect, after 2002, after the Enron and Worldcon collapse, the survey did indicate a loss in confidence. Similarly, when asked about their confidence in major businesses, after the Bosky scandal was revealed, rather than a loss in confidence, there was again a modest increase in confidence. And again, after the Enron and Worldcom scandal or collapse, there was a decrease in confidence. Now, I recognize that there are several other factors that could have influenced both the indirect measures that I looked at, as well as the survey results. But the fact remains that of the available empirical data, there's no support of a loss of confidence due to insider trading. But on the other hand, fraud and corporate collapse do seem to cause a loss of confidence. Now, moving on now to the second argument that's commonly made against insider trading, that commentators have claimed that it is necessary to prohibit insider trading as a practice in order to protect property rights in information. The idea is that firms should, be, should have their property rights in their information so they are incentivized to produce socially valuable information. However, this incentive motivation is only applicable in some insider trading situations. You, you don't need this incentive in fraud inhibiting insider trading situations because the information is not typically developed, rather it's usually something that is unexpected and kind of just occurs. So the type of information that we want to protect are things like a valuable resource like gold on a particular piece of property. That type of information is difficult to obtain, um, it's expensive, it takes time, and it's valuable for everybody once it is obtained. So we want to protect and we want to increase the incentive to produce that type of information. In fraud inhibiting insider trading scenarios, the type of information is things like consumers are no longer buying your product or the raw materials have become more expensive. It's not the type of information that is difficult to obtain, and it's not the type of information that we really need to increase the incentives in order to have it produced. Furthermore, some research has actually indicated that when insider trading has essentially been allowed by executives, corporations have actually reduced the amount of compensation paid to the executives. On average, the data indicates that when these executives on limited in limited ways are allowed to trade, their direct compensation is actually reduced by 20%. Now, if this research is correct, then the claim that inside information should be treated as a type of theft carries less weight because the executives are not actually stealing this information, but rather they're buying and paying for it. Now, given the reduced reliability of the arguments that typically support a general prohibition of insider trading, combined with the increased benefits of fraud inhibiting insider trading, I propose that a safe harbor be created that would allow this type of trading. Thank you. <clears throat> excuse me. F finally, excuse me. <clears throat> We're going to hear from Professor Jason Yaki from the University of Wisconsin. I'd first like to thank the Federal Society for inviting me. I think it's probably been a long time since somebody from Madison, Wisconsin has, uh, has been at this event. Um, 
I'm quite lonely, and so if I can convince any of you to move to Madison, maybe we can tip the balance in the in this, in this city. Um, please, please come join me in that lovely, in that lovely place. I think that perhaps my paper should have been in the first group, but I'll defer to, I'll defer to Richard on that. I, I, I disagree with him at my at my peril, as 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 you can imagine. Yeah. Um, and, and so my my paper. <laughs> My paper is called Testing the Ossification Thesis, an Empirical Examination of Federal Regulatory Volume and Speed from 1950 to 1990. Uh, the paper has lots of great graphs and figures. I've not brought them with me given the time constraints and because we'd probably blind Richard if I turned the projector on. Um, but if any of you would like to see the full paper, please email me and I will send you a, a link to it. Uh, in the paper, I am addressing a prominent uh, strand of the administrative law literature uh, that claims that the federal regulatory process is fundamentally broken in the sense of being ossified. And I'll explain what that means in a second. Uh, the source of this theory, I think the, 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 um, the most obvious source of this theory of ossification or this thesis of ossification is a really interesting, and I think um, deservedly influential paper by uh, Tom McGarity at UT Austin that he wrote in 1992. Uh, and Professor McGarity, along with um, many other um, observers of the federal regulatory process, claim that, uh, claim that uh, federal agencies are unable to adequately produce regulations that are socially beneficial um, or are unable to produce socially beneficial regulations um, efficiently enough, quickly enough, uh, because of various procedural constraints or hoops and hurdles that have been placed upon federal agencies by the courts, uh, by the White House, and by Congress. Uh, and so Professor McGarity points, for example, to the development of the so-called hard look doctrine, which emerged out of the D.C. Circuit in the 70s, um, and under which federal courts allegedly take uh, a very sort of intrusive review of the propriety of federal regulations, sending back many uh, regulations as defective for further work. Um, Ossification scholars, Professor McGarity, point to the imposition of centralized White House review of rulemakings through the Office of Management uh, and Budget or through o OIRA, which is run now by, by Cass Sunstein. Um, uh, they also point to various ways in which Congress has uh, put constraints upon agency autonomy to regulate using their bureaucratic expertise. And so Congress, uh, uh, for example, um, uh, through the Regulatory Flexibility Act requires agencies before promulgating certain rules uh, to analyze and to consider their effects on small businesses. Congress passed the Paperwork Reduction Act, which as many of you know, requires agencies to get OMB approval uh, for any form that imposes an information collection burden upon the public, et cetera, et cetera. And the basic idea is that all of these constraints have made it really, really hard for agencies to regulate. Uh, and so society is not getting the regulations that they need agencies aren't able to do the things they're supposed to do. Uh, this thesis emerged in, as I said, in the early 1990s. Uh, we can view it, I think, as a reaction, a political reaction or a partisan reaction. I don't mean that in a bad way. Um, to, to, okay. Um, in, a, in a bad way to, to, to President Reagan's default assumption that government is the problem and not the solution. And so I think it's probably fair to, to call Professor McGarity um, somebody on the left, and I think he and others were concerned that or suspicious of uh, Reagan's and, 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 and the court sort of reasons for getting more involved in overseeing the regulatory process. So in my paper, I'm trying to test whether or not the regulatory process actually has become ossified. It's a descriptive, positive paper and not, um, and not, a, normative, and not a normative one. I'm not generally a normative scholar. Most people here are probably far more normative than I am. And so what I'm really trying to do is simply see whether or not the process, the regulatory process is broken. Um, how do we do that? It poses a whole lot of issues. There are a lot of sort of weaknesses and, and flaws in the paper that I won't get into, um, that I won't get into here. But at a very basic level, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to look at the volume and speed of regulation in what I call the pre-ossified era. And so before, let's say, 1975 or so. So before the emergence of the hard look doctrine, before we see um, OMB uh, review, um, White House review of rulemaking really, uh, uh, really strengthened under first under Carter and then under Reagan before Congress gets involved with overseeing rulemaking. So looking at rulemaking before and looking at and comparing it in a very simple and basic way to rulemaking after, so rulemaking in the ossified area. How do I do that? Um, first, I, I count up regulations. Believe it or not, we actually know empirically very little about the modern administrative state. Um, very few people are doing empirical ad, ad law work. Um, Anne Joseph O'Connell at Berkeley is, is, is someone whose work I highly recommend. Um, and so I essentially count up regulations. 
um, in the earlier area, era and compare them to the later area. What agencies do I focus on? For various reasons, I focus on all the rule writing agencies in the Department of Interior. Um, Interior is not a sexy agency, but it does lots of stuff. It covers a wide variety of regulatory areas, and its structure has been relatively stable over time, and so it allows us to do a good before and after uh, comparison to see if uh, regulation is ossified now where it, where it hasn't been in the past. Um, the ossification thesis predicts that we have fewer regulations than we need now. Now, what does it mean to say we have fewer regulations than we need? That raises a lot of very difficult um, epistemological questions. What I do is I look at whether or not we have fewer regulations coming out of interior, both at the department level and at agency level, than we had in the past. And I have neat charts that show that overall we actually see that um, Interior has maintained an ability to push through lots of regulations uh, in the relatively recent past. In fact, the overall volume of Interior regulations is 52% higher now than it was in the allegedly pre-ossified era. When we actually break down the analysis to look at, in, in, at individual agencies, and so the big agencies in Interior are the Bureau of Indian Affairs, uh, Bureau of Land Management, Fish and Wildlife Service, National Park Service, what we see is some variation. Some agencies actually issue fewer regulations than they have in the past, BIA and the National Park Service, for example. But Fish and Wildlife, because of its expanded duties under the Endangered Species Act, issues a lot more regulations than it used to. Um, so 171% more regulations in recent years than in the pre-ossified era. Um, what explains why BIA and, and National Park Service uh, seem less willing and able to regulate now than they um, were in the past is that ossification I argue in the paper it's actually not. What we see are, are changes in congressional demand or agency mandate over that period of time. And so in the late 70s, Congress took away a lot of BIA's duties and, and devolved them to tribes and to a lesser extent to state courts. National Park Service's budget has been slashed uh, dramatically, and that explains, I think, why it doesn't regulate very much. How long does it take to regulate? Um, McGarrity and others claim that it takes often five years to get a regulation from proposal to promulgation stage these days, or 10 years. It takes a very long time. And so what I actually did, and um, I can explain the mechanics of it if you're interested, is to match up um, proposals to regulate, NPRMs are called, Notices of Proposed Regulation, that are published in the Federal Register to final rules. And you can count the days between those. And with computers, this ends up being well, time consuming and boring, but, but doable. Um, and I show in the paper uh, how the time to regulate, so time from proposal to time to promulgation, actually does change between the two periods. And so these days, um, it does take longer for agencies to promulgate regulations, so in accordance with the ossification thesis. On the other hand, in the 50s and 60s, agencies were pushing out regulations oftentimes in about 90 days. That's all, they'd issue a proposal, they'd probably get two comments, they'd probably throw them in the trash, and they'd, and they'd issue a final binding regulation. These days, regulations take, on average, the median regulation takes about a year, a little less than a year to go from proposal to promulgation. Um, today, about 85, 90% of regulations that are promulgated as legally binding rules um, are promulgated within two years of the initial proposal. And so the really interesting and difficult question is whether or not that is too long to regulate. Um, if we look at uh, the work of Professor McGarry and others, um, two years to move a regulation from proposal to final rule um, is much less than the five years that people have claimed a lot of regulations take to actually be, to be promulgated. Uh, a couple of other analyses I make in the paper, I look at whether in the modern, allegedly ossified area, proposed regulations are less likely to actually result in promulgated regulations. And so the ossification thesis would say that uh, these days agencies propose regulations, there's lots of resistance, they abandon the regulations at a higher rate than they used to. In fact, what we see over time is that the success rate of proposed regulations is, is remarkably stable. And so for the most part, um, for, for almost all of the agencies, the success rates are about 80, 85%. So 85% of, of proposed federal regulations in the agencies I look at actually end up being legally binding um, final rules. In the paper, I also examine uh, whether or not agencies have incentives to abandon the no formal notice and comment procedure of regulation and uh, to regulate through uh, surreptitious, uh, probably illegal means, through secret regulations, through guidance manuals, um, uh, through uh, announcements, press releases, and that kind of thing. The ossification thesis says that because regulations become so difficult, agencies are engaged in the secret regulation. I'll skip the details. I don't find much evidence that that's happened um, either. The last point um, I want to make is um, I want to make a pitch for why we care about whether ossification is a reality or not. My conclusion is that it doesn't seem to be. It takes longer to regulate, but not that much longer than it used to. Agencies are still able to push out lots of rules. Um, their capacity to regulate hasn't been um, 
uh, hasn't been uh, destroyed, it's not in crisis. Um, so why should we care? Well, because most administrative law scholars assume ossification is a reality. And they say, listen, there's ossification, therefore we need to do things. What do we need to do? Well, we need to, they say, eliminate opportunities for, um, for public oversight, of the, for public and political oversight of the regulatory process. We need, for example, perhaps to, uh, to reduce or eliminate judicial review. So make it impossible, make it hard for courts to check arbitrary uh, agency action. We need to um, limit or uh, eliminate uh, White House uh, coordination or review of rulemaking. We need to scale back on cost-benefit analysis, um, that sort of thing. And I argue in the paper that these kinds of oversight mechanisms actually, um, I think most scholars would assume and, and, and many argue, serve very valuable purposes. They serve as a check on arbitrary agency action and they ensure, help to ensure um, that agencies are held accountable um, for the regulations. Uh, and I argue in the paper that because we have such a limited evidence of ossification, we really should think twice before we uh, propose as legal academics or actually implement, God forbid, um, very, serious changes to, uh, very serious changes to the current regime, which I think does a relatively decent job of ensuring that the people and politicians have appropriate input into the regulatory process. So that's the paper. Thank you. I want and in my notes. Um, uh, look, as again, my, my match the skills at classification uh, are perfectly evident, uh, but I will talk about these two papers very briefly. And again, I have the same sorts of reactions that these are really wonderfully careful and thorough pieces of work uh, that show the kind of diligence that I've never been able to muster in my committee, in my career on these things. Um, and yet the same problem exists as to what's the framing and how it is that you wish to place them within some kind of a larger context. So let me start with uh, Robert Wagner's paper and, and, and see if I could make the point clear. Uh, one of the interesting papers that was not cited in his paper, I went back and checked, was the Fischel and Carlton paper on insider trading written in the Stanford Law Review in, in 1983. And since these are two of my buddies, I, I would mention and recommend it to you now. Uh, the paper, that paper asked the following question, of which Rob's is a subset. He said, imagine you have two corporations which are perfectly identical in all particular relevant fashions, and that the only point of variation between the two of them is will you have by charter a prohibition on insider trading by the executive officials of that particular company, the board of directors and the senior employees, or will you not, and which of them will attract the higher price at the initial offering? And the conclusion that they urge for is that they think that the uh, particular situation that is going to allow for at least some insider trading, or maybe all insider trading, will sell at a higher initial price than those things in which the prohibition is going to take place. Uh, the interesting question under these circumstances is, do we only want to do all or some or none? Or, the, as I would put the question, if you rephrased it and said somebody who had to deal with the rules that were imposed by the federal government under 10b-5, and in the alternative put those which would be imposed by voluntary contract which would sell higher, I think the answer would be pretty clear that the contract solutions would be higher than the government solutions given the high uh, sort of awareness in the competitive markets. Now what's going on here, and this is what Rob, I think, really hits upon, and I want to stress it. It's that, in fact, the disclosure regime that is imposed by the uh, uh, SEC and by the various rules has a fundamental flaw associated with its operation. Uh, generally speaking, the vision that they have of these rules is that the disclosure is only made to a bunch of anxious investors, all of whom will now use this in order to evaluate the prospects of the firm. Uh, but last I looked, anybody can read a public disclosure, and that includes any competitor of a particular firm who can use the information that is disclosed to inform the shareholders of the value of the information to reduce the value of that information by engaging in activities which they now can understand are valuable, which they would have not been able to do without that. So, for example, if you're a pharmaceutical company and you've now had a drug which seems to have tanked and the question is whether or not you disclose the failure to the market, you don't want to do that in some sense if what it's going to do is tell everybody else to reorient their stuff and their investigations into areas in which you now are basically putting more of your money in there. Or if you go back to the original Texas Gulf Sulphur case, if you have to announce that, well, I found these huge deposits in this location in Timmins, Ontario, or wherever it was, somebody's going to start taking up leases, you know, five, ten miles away, and you're going to get worse. 
our results. So good news or bad news in many cases, if you buy and sell stocks, you can convey to the world that you've got valuable information um, which it alters the prospects of the firm without disclosing to competitors ways that will allow you to undermine it. And essentially, it's a variation on that particular theme, I think, that Rob is pushing forward, right? In this particular case, saying if you have to disclose bad information under certain circumstances, or you can trade it, the disclosures may be more harmful to the firm than the trading, and in the next anti world, people would understand that and would tolerate the particular result. And I think what this starts to show again is just how complicated information markets turn out to be and how perilous it is to think that a form of direct public regulation, which doesn't take into account the segmented nature of the audiences, is in fact going to be able to work. And what his proposal essentially does is the second order matter is he says, I'm looking at the loss side, I'm not looking at the gain side, although the gain side can be subject to a similar analysis, and then trying to put a bunch of stops in there so as to make sure that the only only people who could take advantage of this are not those who are essentially the malefactors to begin with. And generally speaking, I think it's probably an incremental proposal which I would uh, support, which means that it would get a huge amount of public abuse with respect to all these, you know, these responsible paladins who are going to make sure that we do not sully their particular model. Uh, Henry Manny started this a long time ago, trying to explain, in fact, the compensation point. I think it's instructive that Rob has been able to confirm that to the extent that you say where there is greater latitude with respect to what you can do with information, it turns out you get a lower base rate, which helps shareholders and so forth. The one other point that I would make, which I think he makes, but I want to stress it again, is that insider trading is essentially does nothing to the underlying assets that are internal to the firm. It doesn't increase their value or destroy their value. Looting a firm is a rather different kind of operation. Entering into a set of contracts, for example, which sort of announce to the world that we really don't have a highly leveraged operation when there's secret options to repurchase that do. Those are not insider trading violations. Those are essentially violations which is sent, loot the firm. And you have to have a very different response to information stuff with respect to shares and those particular assets, those actions which have direct effects on the underlying assets. And a lot of the modern law doesn't distinguish sufficiently between them, and I commend him for drawing that distinction to our attention. Now, Jason is back in the administrative world camp, and so essentially I got the papers misaligned, but it's the same basic point. Um, uh, there is an oxymoron in the English language, and that oxymoron is beneficial administrative regulations. I mean, <laughs> one has to ask the sort of independent question as to whether or not you think these things are good or bad. Now, I know Tom McGarity, and, and I, he's never seen a regulation that he doesn't like. And, you know, my view about it is that occasionally you find a rare gem which actually does more good than harm, but many of the regulations that you see propounded are in effect all too faithful implementations of a regulatory scheme that are fatally flawed. And so under these circumstances, when I start to see a 15% attack rate, I start to lament, why is this number not higher under the circumstances, given the mission that takes place? And the answer goes back to what we said before, is that the statutes, say something like the Endangered Species Act, often have very badly constructed situations in terms of how they deal with these things. And the administrators are often great enthusiasts for the statutes they have, and they tend to be single-minded with respect respect to mission and relatively oblivious with respect to collateral costs, and forward they go. Occasionally the courts will slap them down and so forth. Now my own view therefore about this situation is that it's extremely difficult to make welfare judgments about the state of the administrative world by looking at the volume of regulations that do or do not get through or at the timing. And in fact, I think what, what Jason does, and it's a really commendable service, is say don't look at the conspicuous cases that get reported in the papers where there are all these things that uh, are struck down in, in great form, in net neutrality regulations and so forth. But what you have to do is to look at the huge bundle of these things and figure that out on a mass basis rather than taking this kind of very selective sampling that comes from newspapers paper stories. On the other hand, there's another complication, of course, with respect to this, uh, and this is going to be hinted at by some proposals that Jim DeMint seems to make, which says that you want to put a regulation that involves more than $100 million, you've got to get it back to Congress for an approval by both houses. This was floated the other day. I don't think it will succeed. The question one wants to ask about his study is, 
don't just look at before and after in terms of days for regulation. Ask yourself what you think to be the economic impact by way of transfer payments between groups or total compliance costs and so forth. And what you will find, I suspect, is that you were playing low stakes poker for the most part before 1975, and you're playing rather high stakes, table stakes poker when you're doing things today. The prediction that you would make, therefore, is that there would be more resistance with respect to regulation from losers in a high stake game than a low stake game. And if, in fact, you start to observe that the time of these things is going up is you know, a matter of months rather than a matter of years, which I think Jason you know, pretty conclusively shows, the implication I get is these administrators are absolutely terrific in this perverse sense of pushing through the system a set of regulations that are extremely complicated and shielding them from all sorts of inquiry. I am working right now on a series of regulations associated with the Durban Amendment and interchange, and I, you know, I think the the Federal Reserve Board, in terms of the way in which it has handled the administrative process, really understands the way this thing works and has created pretty much a bulletproof record. That doesn't mean I like the statute, which I think is perverse and idiotic and all sorts of grounds, but it's not the problem of administration. It's the problem of the substantive law that is going to be enforced. And so I'm going to end on the note that I began. We've had five papers here. Uh, basically, the two papers that start to deal with the economic type situation were relatively pro-market type papers, and I think you know, suggest important reforms on how you st stabilize and enforce contracts. The three administrative law papers all, I think, express a kind of an anxiety about the way in which the current system is trying to be put together, uh, but cannot come up within that particular framework with a set of uh, solutions that satisfy even their authors. I mean, the way in which I read it is it's a tentative judgment that I think I can make things a little better if I don't tamper with this or if I do tamper with that, but that the basic drivers of the size of legislation, which goes back to the constitutional issues, and this sets us up for lunch, of course, because when you talk about Obamacare and constitutionality, you really are dealing with the question as to whether or not we're going to expand the scope of government by yet another order of magnitude. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We've got about 10 minutes for questions. Yes. tend to see uh, in the reconciliation process temporary legislation which has a simple majority vote but there's nothing uh, in the voting rules that said that we need to have only a simple majority vote for all temporary legislation unless it goes through the reconciliation process then we still need a supermajority vote um, I guess the larger question that you're asking is whether or not a supermajority vote can uh, produce more lasting legislation and I think uh, that's something that we should certainly consider uh, in the debate over uh, the removal of the filibuster, for instance. Uh, um, but I, I tend to think that um, uh, the issue is a, a bit distinct from what I'm addressing in that there are no 
separate voting requirements uh, for temporary legislation and permanent legislation currently. Yes. A question for Andrew Schwartz. I really like what you have to say about consumer <coughs> contracts, and I'm thinking in particular about the standardization point. Uh, you used the example of Avis and Thrifty or rental cars to uh, price line. And I, I don't know factually if it's accurate to say that these really are standard contracts. And maybe Avis, you pay more for gas than Thrifty, or maybe Thrifty has an arbitration clause and Avis does. And I, I don't know that they are truly identical contracts. And, and so I guess my first question is just the factual one, whether I'm right that they're not identical. And then the second question is, do they, even if it's okay that they're not identical for the individual consumer to buy on Priceline, maybe I don't care about those kind of details of the contract. I'm just looking at price for the midside car in, in Denver. If we did get to the point of speculators buying in bulk the right to rent two days in Denver and mid-size car, would it then have to be standardized to, to have the secondary market of people buying and selling it at that point? Uh, thank, thank you for the question. Um, on the, on the question of, uh, as a matter of fact, whether uh, Thrifty and Avis have an identical contract in every way, um, I, I don't know, to be honest. And I think you're probably right that there probably are some differences. Uh, but the most salient terms or the most important terms, all the relevant terms to uh, uh, the consumer, are all identical. They're always unlimited miles. They're always, uh, you know, whatever it is, you have to pay for the gas. Um, it, would they have to be further standardized uh, if this uh, market really were to mature? I think that it probably would. I think that you, you're probably right that um, uh, more sophisticated parties might, uh, you know, there might be many more terms that are uh, actually relevant and would need to be uh, more perfectly standardized. But um, I, I, I really would like to look into the facts a little bit more. Thank you, Professor Ward. Yes, sir. 
federal regulation should get out of the way and allow that to happen. All three of us <coughs> This has been a marvelous presentation by the five and by our commenter, Richard, and uh, let's give them a round of applause. <laughs>